you've been looking at these people up on the screen here for the last 30 minutes. They were kind enough to uh, give us photographs uh, from a long time ago. And uh, this is the 70th anniversary of the internment of Japanese American citizens, the beginning of the internment of Japanese American citizens during World War II. And uh, there's a book called Farewell to Manzanar. And the author of that book will be speaking. We have no microphone, so this is the best it's going to be. The author of that book will be speaking on September 29th at the Hercules Library. It's part of the California Reads program. She's doing presentations all over the state at libraries. This program is a prelude to that, and we are doing this program in concert with the Pinole Library, and this is Tim Madigan, the librarian in the city of Pinole. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for coming. And he's going to talk a little later about the September 29th program. So uh, I have some people to thank. Uh, first of all, I, I want to welcome all of you. Uh, I would like to recognize uh, Joanne Nakamura from Congressman Miller's office. Where are you? Thank you for coming. She won't say it. She actually put together this whole program. She arranged for the speakers. She arranged for all of the photographs that you're going to see. And so thank you, Barbara. So I'd like to introduce our four panelists. This is George Yoshida, Chizu Iyama, Yoshiro Tokiwa, and Joan Matsuoka. They all have experience in the internment camps uh, starting in 1942. And so we are going to have each of them speak for a short period of time. Uh, I'll be showing a slide presentation while Joan speaks and some photographs of, uh, of the others uh, while they're speaking, and then we will open it up to questions from the audience. So, uh, first speaking, um, Jim, will be can I just say something real quick before you get started? I'm sorry. I was just running from the, between the two libraries because this is part of the um, California Reads grant from the California Humanities, and uh, we do have free copies of the book that you can grab at the end here for um, La Cia Radio, and uh, I'm sorry, La Cia Radio and Fair All Demands in Art. There's, uh, there's lots of copies to be checked out of the, the various libraries all throughout West Contra Costa County. If you get a chance, please fill out one of the surveys after for the partnership. There's lots going on, including a concert of the park this Saturday at Refugio Park in um, Hercules. And so um, and both authors will be at um, various libraries. So lots of free books to give at UAD each of our West County libraries. And if you get on the Contra Costa Library a website, what's the? Uh, CCCLIB.org. CCCLIB.org. Uh, you'll find a listing of all the programs that they're doing all over uh, the county. Okay, so uh, Joan, welcome, and I'm going to put on your slideshow. Oh, all right. Um, good evening. My pictorial presentation is a personal family one and starts from spring of 1939, my age two and a half, attending the World Fair at Treasure Island in that year with my grandmother and mother. My maternal grandmother is the immigrant who came to the U.S., married my grandfather, and had seven children of whom, next, my mother was the oldest of all the children born to her all being born in San Francisco, as was I, a third generation American. My mother attended Jean Parker Elementary School and Galileo High School, was active in her school sports, and participated in YWCA events with her friends. Next. No, the previous one. This shows my dad, born in Sunnyvale, down the peninsula. He attended the Palo Alto schools and San Jose State, playing on their baseball teams. 
I like this photo in that it amuses me that being dressed up was the rule, even when fishing <laughs> or going to the beach. Next. I was an only child for quite a few years, and this photo on the Bay Ferry was taken by someone else. I consider this our family portrait for those times. This picture and the next one illustrates further how dressy people's attire was in those days, the 1930s and 40s, so fashionable. <laughs> Both these pictures were taken at a park in San Francisco. Showed my father. <coughs> okay, now the next. Uh, this photo of my mother and me was taken in front of an apartment house owned by my grandfather. This is on Webster Street, between Geary and O'Farrell Streets. I have memories there of being raised in typical American fashion, being read nightly Mother Goose Rhymes and Robert Louis Stevenson poems among children's classics. This is now September 1941, and I had turned five years old. In a few months, the bombing of Pearl Harbor would take place. Now there was upheaval, wartime hysteria, and our eventual incarceration was about to take place. This kindergarten picture was taken by Dorothea Lang, who worked for the WRA, War Relocation Authority, who documented, among others, children at Raphael Wheel School, which this is. Next. We kindergartners who are about to leave the area posed for this picture taken by someone else before our families were rounded up and sent to an assembly center. For us, Tamperan Racetrack, before being imprisoned in internment camps. This is a photo of one of the horse stalls we had to live in for a few months while Topaz was being constructed. Being five years old, all I can recall is the smell of hay and manure, the crinkly mattresses, and a bare hanging light bulb for our lighting. My mother was a very neat and tidy person, and she disliked our surroundings. I read where the residents had to supply their own plates and utensils for each meal time and stand in line, but I do not recall any of that. I have I had this photo and am presuming it was a bus transporting people to the train station to go to Topaz. This is a photo of Topaz, deep within a desert, about 16 miles away from the closest town, which was Delta in Utah. There were 42 residential blocks of 12 barracks for each block. Each block then had six units or apartments. I have close-ups later. This is my second grade picture. There were two elementary school districts. Mine was named Desert View School. I don't know what the other elementary school district was named because everywhere had a desert to view. <laughs> In the summer of 1943, people were allowed to go up to Provo for harvest work and this tent city was constructed. I tagged along with my father for this as a short break from Topaz life. I am pictured here with a woman friend. As a side note, I had a paternal uncle in an internment camp elsewhere, Park Mountain, Wyoming, doing similar harvest work outside the camp, and he had been shot at, resulting in lifelong complications from the bullet which could not be removed from his body. This photo shows a snowstorm having taken place in the desert. Their winters can reach zero degrees or lower, and their summers can reach 100 degrees and higher. If you notice the perpendicular barrack in the background, that is where the lavatories, washroom, and laundry area were. Unseen behind the residence barrack was the mess hall for dining. This shows a closer view of the front entrance for each unit. In the spring of 1944, I now have a baby sister and am no longer an only child. 
Next. This is a photo of a friend with my sister and me. Next. In late May 1945, my grandfather left Topaz for the Bay Area, followed by my father, who left in early June to join him in search of housing. And finally, by July of 1945, my mother, sister, and I were allowed, allowed to leave Topaz, and we resettled in Berkeley to resume a normal life. Normal, as of having a regular house, regular bedrooms, a kitchen, and family meal times together. This is a family portrait taken in the fall of 1945. In the next several years, our family would include a son and a third daughter. Thank you. George Yoshida. Um, you saw the some of the slides earlier. You saw a dance band there. It was in Poston, California. About, oh no, Arizona, excuse me. And the handsome alto sax player was me. <laughs> <laughs> we played the music of Glenn Miller, Tommy Dorsey, oh, yes. dances on the weekends. And uh, there's another photograph of a handsome GI with a cap and a, a woman with the le leopard skin uh, uh, coat. It cost uh, $143. I remember that because that was in Chicago. After we left camp, those were post-war days, but $143 meant close to over a, a month's worth of, of work in the office. I didn't pay for it. She paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's just post-war, but it's pre war time and but I didn't get into the, uh, uh, in Poston. Now, this is a hospital, Kaiser Hospital, and I'm reminded of the time when I was in camp in Poston, worked in the hospital there. And I called myself a, a bedpan jockey because <laughs> I was an orderly, but that's something else. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my leaving camp. I was, spent one year in camp working in the orderly, as an orderly, also playing some jazz on the weekends for the dances. But it's time to leave. I just could not deal with being in camp very long. Many of us were allowed to leave camp, to go to school, to work uh, on jobs, not back in the Pacific Coast, but to the Midwest. And I wrote a rather lengthy essay, and instead of my mumbling about it, I'm gonna read it. I'm sorry to read it, but I will do that. After a year of detention in Boston, I, with many others, had received official clearance to relocate to the Midwest. We were no longer Japs. Imagine mainstream America had earlier screamed, Japs, Japs, you can't trust them, put them away, put them all away. Leaving Poston was our release from prison. I was going to Chicago. Leaving Poston was our prison, yes. Friends and hopefully good jobs awaited us. Still, I could not dismiss the thought of Uncle Sam, sooner or later pointing a finger at me and saying, I want you. You know what it meant, right? In those days, some of you, I want you. The reason for this is that many Japanese American servicemen had already been serving in Europe and proven themselves to be disciplined and, and dependable. So one day, back in camp, on a cool and calm April morning, I stuffed a few pieces of clothing and uh, an old uh, toothbrush into my bag, said my goodbyes to Mama and Papa. And I don't know how they really felt about my leaving them. Probably my Mama thought that I might be swallowed up by an unfriendly city, Chicago. She looked somewhat sad, not smiling. Papa said nothing as usual. Now he, had, I, and he and I had been knocking heads and arguing. He used to call me, hey, you're not a good son at all. You're selfish. You're a selfish and a thoughtless person. And you need to grow up. 
I didn't, of course, agree with that. <laughs> My two younger sisters, Masa and Toshi, often victims of an ego-consumed big brother, <laughs> may have had smiles on their faces. I think they did. Probably glad to see me go. There were others, of course, but there were about 10 of us who climbed eagerly into the bed of a dusty strapped truck. And when the driver kicked the engine over, I thought, damn, we're on our way to Chicago, the windy city. It's going to be great. S skyscrapers, theaters, restaurants. And maybe, maybe, got my fingers crossed, just a day with a, a date with a cute chick. <laughs> oh boy, that would be great. I was so excited, I hardly noticed a handful of camp internees waving us goodbye. Soon we approached a lonesome railroad station in Parker, Arizona. Following an interminable wait, we boarded the slow train to freedom. Yeah, I'm on my way to Chicago. Free, unwhite, and 21. <laughs> no longer subject to the censure <clears throat> and strictures of mama and papa. I mean, they always used to scold me. Joji, turn the radio down. Too loud, you disturb neighbor in the next barrack. Or, Joji, no, come home late at night after dance. Everybody's sleeping, you make too much noise. Or, Joji, come eat with me and Papa. You all time go eat with friends. You know, I know they meant well, they meant well. But Mama, Papa, and all of us in just a single back room, what a drag. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> That's what I said, yes. And posted camp quickly became a blurred memory. New thoughts, questions popped into my mind. An uneasy mind, of course. What about housing, jobs? What am I going to find in Chicago? Will I be able to go to a nice restaurant, pick up a menu and order? Will they serve me? Damn, not going to be very easy in Chicago. I really hadn't thought about it, but about the ways and means of life in Chicago. But maybe Poston in camp was maybe not too bad after all. Yeah. It was easy. Going to Chicago felt wonderful, wonderful. It, but it was coupled with grave misgivings of an unknown future. The journey took two days and two nights of suffering the discomforts of an ancient train pulled by an outdated steam engine. As we at long last approached the inner city of Chicago and its grand central station, we were greeted in a series of graffiti splashed freight cars dilapidated factories and unkempt residences. Ooh, is this Chicago? Well, my first breakfast on the outside was so beautiful, I'll never forget it. My first breakfast. It was at the American Friends Service Committee, their hostel on the north side of Chicago. The sun was bright. It was warm in the breakfast nook. And I was at the table alone, not hundreds of contenders, alone. That was nice, warm. And of course, not being called to, to, to chow by a nerve-wracking sound of the heavy duty iron triangle. I felt joyful, joyful, so great. I don't remember all that I ate that morning. I do remember putting a slice of white bread into an electric toaster, patiently waiting for it to complete its chore. And when the toast popped up, I carefully knifed onto it a dab of real butter. <laughs> real butter. This memorable ritual was so long, long in coming so long. 
the first crunchy bite of this delectable morsel was heavenly. Just toast, and it was heavenly. Thank you. And uh, it hit us like a terrible bomb hit us, because the first thing that happened was everybody began to say, oh, there are Japanese around, and there are Japanese Americans. And at the university, uh, people were very kind. My professors were wonderful, so that I didn't feel any uh, anger on their part uh, displaced onto me. But if you went through some of the areas, other areas of San Francisco, there were glances that looked at you as if something was wrong. You felt uh, very self-conscious about uh, Japan bombing Pearl Harbor. Now, I want to point out, we had nothing to do with that. We were American citizens. I was a Nisei, second generation Japanese. My father was an immigrant from Japan, but we were very much a part of our city, very much a part of our schools. So it was really very difficult to think that there was such an outcry against Japanese Americans as we read in the newspapers, as we heard in the, in the radio. Uh, it was very difficult for us. Uh, then about uh, in February of 1942, there was a, uh, I guess, uh, through the radio, they pointed out that uh, there was a big move to move us out of California. Now that was again something that was so uh, outlandish. We couldn't believe that this was going to happen to us. But we were told that we needed to leave. And they gave us dates and they told us to get ready. Now did they send us a letter? No, they didn't send us a letter. What we discovered was that not only the newspapers but also the uh, post office had uh, uh, posters on that said that all Japanese Americans had to leave. Uh, they gave us dates on when we should get ready and where we should go. Now this was not an individual uh, uh, information to us, but it was something that came as we looked around in the newspapers, the radios, all told us that we had to leave. And because we were such law-abiding people, we left and we're ready. We gathered to the places where they told us to go, when we should go, where we should go, and we didn't really know what was happening. We didn't know where we was going, where we were going. We didn't know how long we were going to stay. We didn't know what was going to happen to us during that time, or would they send us to Japan? None of us had, uh, most of us who were these, they had never been to Japan and knew very little about about others' uh, country. So again, it was a time of a lot of uh, uh, worry as to what was going to happen to all of us. And we were again, I was at the university and I asked the professors and they said, we don't know what's going to happen. And, uh, but they were very helpful. And they actually even gave me grades so that I could graduate from the university because it was just, uh, in 1942. So uh, the university was supportive, uh, but uh, not the uh, people in administration or nor the people uh, who were calling for uh, harsh measures. These were newspapers and radios. Terrible to hear the radio talk about those of us who are Japanese Americans who are potential saboteurs or spies or things of that kind. And so it was a difficult, difficult period. We finally learned at some point that the government was going to put us away, that they had started a uh, temporary program but uh, of people to leave on their own. But where would you go? There were some people who tried to leave, but they met hostility as they went by. Uh, they didn't know how to get uh, to places which would be safe for them. And so the voluntary evacuation of California, Washington, and Oregon was really stymied because of the difficulty of people trying to flee those places to go some, to some area where people would 
not uh, be hostile to you. And so the government stopped that, and they decided to take us all into camps. And so we were given um, time, I think we were given one week, from <coughs> five um, uh, days, um, including, um, and if you conclude the two uh, weekends, it would be uh, seven days in which to get ready to leave. Now, we didn't know where we were going. They didn't tell us where we would go. They didn't tell us how long would you stay. They didn't tell us what conditions would you find. Now, we had to try to get all of our things together in five days, take care of our businesses, um, and make sure that uh, uh, things were put away so that uh, they could be retrieved if and when we came back. Very difficult period. My father was taken away. He was very active in the Japanese American community. And so he was taken away almost immediately after Pearl Harbor, which meant that my mother and my sisters and my two younger brothers really had no idea of where we were going or what was going to happen to all of our things so that we left most of our stuff behind. Uh, we gathered together. Again, nobody told us where we would be going. And, you know, we had no idea. So you go over to the place that they told you to go to, and then uh, from there, a bus picked us up, put us on a train. Where were we going? We didn't know where we were going. They told us to pull down the shades so we couldn't look outside, or that people outside couldn't see us. So that, again, we had no idea of how long we were going to be on the train, and where, well, where we were going. Well, we ended up, uh, my group, from Chinatown in San Francisco. Japanese Americans who lived in Chinatown were one of the first people to go. And we found ourselves in Pasadena. Pasadena, <laughs> near Los Angeles. And they herded us out, put us on a bus, and we went to a, uh, I guess, a horse racing place. It's Santa Anita, where horses race. Mm -hmm. And we were put into the horse stalls. Now, the horse stalls had very uh, strong odors. And the fact that we were in uh, uh, Southern California, most of us were from East Bay, where it never got really very hot. We were in San Francisco and uh, maybe Berkeley, Oakland. And so again, we, we were um, astonished that they would put us in a horse stall and then to uh, an area uh, uh, outside of Los Angeles, we turned very hot. Uh, have you ever been to a horse stall on a hot day and had to, <laughs> had to live in one of those places? We did. And for six weeks, we, for six months, we lived in the horse stall. While I was there, I had a big surprise. I got my diploma from the University of California. I received it while I was in a horse stall, and, uh, <laughs> which was, a, a, again, a joy of getting the diploma, but also realizing I'm missing all the grandeur of um, um, of the California, University of California ceremonies for people who graduated. Um, it was a difficult time, but at the same time very challenging. And those of us who were young, and at that point I was 20 years old, so that um, we had opportunities of uh, really working um, together with the people in the camps to develop uh, a style, lifestyle that they could uh, find some joy somewhere in a very dismal situation. Um, we put on all kinds of activities. Again, you know, I was 20 years old, young, active, eager, and I found many people like me. In fact, the uh, average age of the Japanese Americans at that time, the Nisei, the second generation, my generation, was about 12, 18, 19, 20, so that people were young, and full of activity, full of life, and full of optimism. That somewhere we felt that despite the fact that we were being put into camp, that we can try to make life easier for everybody. So we had all kinds of programs. One of the women from USC 
Claude was a music major and she wrote all her wonderful records. <clears throat> so every Sunday night, one of the best things that I could think of at that camp was to sit in the sun, while the sun was setting outside um, uh, in the bleachers, listening to beautiful classical music. And almost everybody went up there because it was such a soothing experience and took you out of living in a horse stall. Again, it was a difficult time. I was the head of, let me add, I was old as a Nisei. Most Nisei were 18 years old or 17 or below. So I was like Adrian, I was 20 years old. And so um, I did, I was, and because I was a graduate of UC Berkeley, I did get responsibilities that were far beyond my uh, capability. And very fortunately, there were other people who were older, who were, uh, more experienced, who helped develop programs. So we had all kinds of programs, especially dances. I mean, when you're, you know, at that age, dances and parties were very important for our young people. And we had discussion groups, and we had, uh, again, for the older people, all kinds of activities for them, poetry classes and uh, uh, art classes and things of that kind. So we were very busy. I was very busy during that period, six months in Santa Anita with, again, a feeling of responsibility of uh, trying to bring in uh, different kinds of activities for the people so that, in fact, we had something called Anita Fanita, July 4th. We had a big fair and we had all these people coming in, uh, 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 actually asking, if they could have time to do something. So we had an uh, entertainment program, but we also had arts and crafts, and we also had serious discussion groups among the uh, Japanese American, especially both the Nisei and the Issei uh, separately. Uh, it was difficult for those of us who are Nisei who are not too good in the Japanese language to be able to really sit in the same group and have a discussion with our parents. So. But it was, again, uh, quite an experience for all of us. And I think that I outgrew my kind of uh, running around uh, things that you do at Cal when you were in uh, college and uh, really settled down to try to learn a little bit more. I was a psychology major, which may not have been the best thing because I got busy. <laughs> but uh, it was a very interesting, uh, positive, in a sense, in a very negative situation for me. Uh, again, what I found both in the uh, uh, camps, in the temporary camps like Santa Anita, and eventually we went to Topaz, which was our, quote, permanent place. And again, there I was a social worker, and I began to get some of the problems that were going on in terms of families and in terms of our older people. You know, think of being six, in the 60s and 70s and going to a place which is totally different from what you have had, living either in a horse stall or living in the hot deserts of uh, uh, Topaz and Utah, of having to contend with uh, the lack of facilities, lack of material, uh, being so shut off from the rest of the country. In fact, little kids used to ask, when are we going to go back to America? because they wondered why they were off in such a financial situation. <clears throat> difficult period, difficult period for parents. How would you like to live in a uh, room with uh, five kids? You, know, how, you would go crazy. And uh, it was very difficult for some of the people to have to cope with the overcrowded, overstimulated, in a sense, uh, program. Every morning, we would see my brother's uh, I had, I had younger brothers, and I would see them peeking through the, through the window call, while we're trying to dress. And they're calling and saying, Tommy, Harry, time to go out for breakfast. And every morning this would happen. And every morning we would always say to my brother, don't tell them to come. We'll go to breakfast by ourselves. But it was one of those group things. And again, uh, nobody wanted to eat but their parents. You know, when you're this age, uh, you didn't want to eat with your parents, you wanted to eat with your friends. So again, there were some problems in terms of living in a 
very uh, uh, in a hostile uh, area in terms of the weather and in terms of living conditions. But I think we did very well, basically because there was a lot of endurance on the part of our parents, of uh, teenage kids, because most of the uh, Nisei, the younger generation, was primarily um, maybe 16, 15, 16, 17, 18, which must be probably the hardest ages for most parents to deal with. So it was a difficult situation, but at this point, I will just talk about the fact that it was very hard for parents, hard for family, hard for the children. But at the same time, there was a unity of people which made all of this possible so we weren't hitting each other, we weren't yelling at each other, we weren't fighting within the camps. And I think that has a lot to do maybe with the uh, uh, fact that uh, we all felt we needed to do something so that there would be no violence and no difficulty in the, in the families and in the camps. I'll leave it at that. Last speaker tonight is uh, Yosh Tokiwa, and uh, and then we will take questions from the audience. Would you like to speak? I'm younger than she is, but I uh, <laughs> <laughs> stand and speak to the group. Well, in a short nutshell, I was born in California. <coughs> California in Pismo Beach. At the time of Pearl Harbor, I was living in Salinas, where my father operated a 80-acre truck farm, and I was a junior in high school. My wife tells me I should go beyond that point. After the war, after the ser service time, I went to UC Berkeley, and I have a degree in biochemistry. I uh, 36 years uh, worked with the California Department of Health where I retired as an air pollution research specialist. And in addition to that, I have worked for 15 years for the U.S. Environmental Protection <coughs> Agency in San Francisco in Eight Bay Region 9, in the, in initially in the PCD program, later in the Toxics Inventory Program. And with that, I'll get on with my, uh, how my life went. Like I said, at the time of Pearl Harbor, I was a junior in high school, and we were, when uh, Executive Order 9066 was issued, and we were ordered to camp, we were ordered to report to the local uh, armory and transported to the Salinas Assembly Center, which was uh, a bunch of barracks built on the Salinas fair, fairgrounds. We went there, or I went, the uh, family and I, the day after my birthday, we went to camp, which was the 30th of April. That's why I know the date. Then on the th uh, 4th of J 3rd of July, we were moved from that camp, put on trains, and shipped over, traveled overnight in blacked out trains down to Arizona. And in the following morning, we arrived in Parker. And when we left Salinas, the temperature was around 70 degrees. On the, third, on the 4th of July in Poston, Arizona, it was only 111. <laughs> I happened to ask one of the people standing near there at the train station, how hot is it? He says, it's only 111. <laughs> it's a cool day today. <laughs> and we were transported then on tr trucks. The women and children were put on buses. All the males were put on open flatbed trucks, standing up and driven 16 miles from Poston to the camp at Poston, Arizona. 
because I was a junior at that time, I spent <coughs> finished my high school in camp. And I think that uh, they wanted me primarily to speak as to my experiences with the 442nd. When we were in camp in February of 1943, they established a separate segregated army unit known as designated the 442nd. They also gave on, uh, had everybody in the camp sign a questionnaire which said, title said, uh, approval request for leave clearance to leave camp, which was erroneous because they had no intention of letting you out. But most of the questions were fairly innocuous, except for two. Uh, question number 28 asked whether you would be willing to serve in the U.S. military services wherever sent. Remember, this was given to everybody, who, every person who was 18 and over. This was asked of women, are you willing to serve? It was asked of the Japanese, our parents, who are not citizens, and so were they, by signing yes, volunteering for the U.S. military? And question 29 was another one. Do you disavow any allegiance to the emperor of Japan? And for a person like my parents, who are not citizens, if this disavow any allegiance to the emperor or the nation of Japan, that means they have no, they are stateless. If you're stateless, you have no passport, you have no papers to remain, uh, permanent residency papers, and therefore you'd be subject, potentially subject to deportation. deportation. For us, we were born here, we're citizens. Do you disavow any allegiance to the Emperor of Japan? or the nation of Japan. Does that mean that we sign yes on that? Could that be interpreted to mean you did have allegiance and therefore now you disavow? <laughs> well, in my case, I did sign no and no in both cases. I mean, yes and yes in both cases. Some people signed, were disgusted and they would sign it. Yes and no. Others signed would, uh, on those two questions would be no and no. If you had one no, or if you qualified the answer, either one of them, it was taken to be no. And this meant then you would be segregated and sent to a separate camp. Many families where one person <coughs> said no, everybody said yes, that meant separating the family, and in many cases, they didn't want to be separated, so they volunteered to go with them. Mm. At that time, too, they created this 442nd, which was a segregated Japanese American unit. Of course, this was segregation. the segregated units were not new. Uh, blacks were segregated and it wasn't until the 1950s that they integrated all the services. So, in the 442nd, when the Pearl Harbor was attacked, the draft was already in force for about a year because of the war in Europe. And so there were about 6,000 Japanese Americans, males that were already in the service. And the defense of Hawaii depended upon two uh, 
regiments, and they were National Guard units. And because the population of Hawaii is about one-third Japanese, they were the largest group, most of the troops and officers in that group were Japanese Americans. So when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, many cases, some of the so Japanese American soldiers were summarily dismissed and reclassified from 4A to 4C. 4C meaning enemy alien, not eligible. So here you're a citizen and you're declared a enemy alien. For others, they took away their rifles that they were training with and they were put to work collecting garbage, transporting, digging ditches, and that sort of thing. And this is why the, the members of the Hawaii groups that were to, to working in these labor battalions asked for and petitioned for a separate unit that they could serve in and they would serve wherever they want. And Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, <coughs> authorized the formation of the 442nd. Actually, it started as a small group. The members of the two <coughs> National Guard units, who were Japanese Americans, were re removed, bundled into, uh, into a single unit, and shipped from Hawaii to Minnesota, and they were designated the 100th Battalion. The assumption was that this would just be some kind of a labor battalion, but they did so well in their training that they, the military recommended they be instituted as an infantry unit. And this has led to the formation of the 442nd, which is a regiment, and a regiment is three times as large as a battalion. So, at the time we had to sign on this questionnaire, they asked us to volunteer for the 442nd. In my case, when they asked, I told them I would volunteer, provided you allow my parents to return to California and uh, return to get, restart their own lives again. The officer who was interviewing me said, I'm sorry, that I understand what you mean. If I could, I would, but I can't. He said, then what would you do if we drafted you? I told him I would go. So I finished my high school in camp, and about a year later they drafted me. And I went and took my training in camp, Camp Shelby, Mississippi, and then we went overseas to Italy. The last fall, I went to Washington, D.C., my family and I, where Congress awarded the Congressional Gold Medal, which is one of these that you can look at later, for the record of the 442nd, as well as the U.S. Military Intelligence Service. I'll give you a little background on the 442nd and their exploit. In a little less than two years, the 442nd was engaged in eight major combat operations. They achieved every objective that was assigned to them. A regiment has about 4,300 people. In the two and a half years or so, 
with the casualties and replacement, they had a, a total of about 14,300 that went through that unit. The 1242nd <coughs> in the two and a half years had seven presidential unit citations, which is more than any other unit in the entire United States history, regardless of size of unit. The number of awards, over 18,000 medals, of which over 9,000 were Purple Hearts. They have 21 medals of honor from such a small unit. They started out with only one. But during the Clinton and the administration, someone asked a question with their background record, how come they only have one? And so they went back. He, President Clinton <coughs> ordered that all the uh, criteria for the awards that were handled at the time be reviewed and they found 20 more that should have been but have been downgraded. <coughs> and so I guess I will tell you about two of the main, of the seven operation two of their major operations. <coughs> the first one was known as the Rescue of the Lost Battalion. The 442nd at that time was assigned to the 36th Texas Division and one of their battalion companies out of the 149th Battalion got cut off by the German troops. They sent two regiments, full fresh regiments, to rescue them, and over four days they failed. They got a radio <coughs> message back, well, you don't rescue us within the next two or three days, we'll be out of ammunition, we'll be out of food, we'll be out of water. And so they sent the 442nd out. And the 442nd was going up after three months of combat. So they only had about two-thirds of their no normal complement. In two days, they broke through and they rescued 211 men. The 442nd losses, casualties was over 800. So the other, other uh, mission that they had was after the rescue of, of, of the uh, lost battalion, they were sent back to Italy because for the last push, north of Pisa and Florence is the Apennine Mountains. And the western anchor was being held by the <coughs> All Black 92nd Division, Infantry Division. They have assaulted that line six times and they were failed each time. Primarily because were, the Germans were all on top of the mountains, which were over 3,000 feet high. They had a clear view of the valley. So they have all their artillery zeroed in. The rumor was that if they see a mouse, if they could spot a mouse or a cat walking, the artillery shell would come after them. That every inch of it was zeroed in. And when the 442nd got there, and they told you that the target was to take those hills. They already knew what the 92nd had. 
done. You see, the whole idea of the campaign was when the Germans find out that the 442nd is with the 92nd, they will know this is a different ball game. They're not going to be stopped that easily. We're going to have to pull reinforcements out and reinforce that western side. Where do we do it? Well, the weakest point is where the Americans and the British in the middle, east of Florence. And so we'll pull the troops out of there and reinforce. And that was the game plan of the Amer the Allied troops. Is by doing that, we can weaken the center. And so three days after the 92nd, 442nd, start their assault, they'll have a general assault by the Americans and the British in the middle and go up over the Apennine Mountains and out into the Po, po Valley. The 442nd, when they got their t mission assigned, they already knew the 92nd had tried, and they said, there's no point in going up there. They had a joke among the 92nd. They said, Lieutenant, what for are we going up that hill? The Germans are going to throw us all the way back again. So what do we do? And so one of the officers looked at the map and he said, how about here? He said, you can't do that. It's a straight cliff. He said, how steep a cliff? It's almost vertical. And he said, you know, it's a, the Germans are not going to be watching that part. Nobody can climb it. The 10th Mountain Division had mountain climbing gear. Let's borrow some. And so the 442nd, one night under cover of night, went into the area of where, and that night, the following night, started climbing the straight, almost straight up uh, slopes. And by 8 o'clock, by sunlight, sunrise next morning, they had one of the companies up on top of the hill and they captured eight of the German sentries that were supposed to be watching them. And so when the 92nd started their assault, the Germans' attention was, att said, here they come again, let's throw them back, and all of a sudden they had somebody, they didn't even know troops behind their back. The California's climate kept drawing people back <laughs> so that all the people, we ended up in Chicago, and then we went to, we were in New York and Chicago, and then we said, oh, but it's so much nicer in California. And I think that a lot of people felt that way, especially the Bay Area people, you know? There's no place like home here. <laughs> Did your family get their property back? Yeah, they got that. In fact, uh, in fact you know, sometimes people make uh, jokes about banks, but these banks, the bank that we worked with, uh, held it together for us. So we feel very grateful. Question here? Yeah. Um, this is for Chizu. Um, you said that there were discussions, in discussion groups in the camp in the that camp? you organized. Uh, what, kind of, what were some of the topics? That, what would you talk about? Well, a lot of it, if you realize that the age of the people in the camp, the Nisei in the camp, we're anywhere between 18 and maybe 24, with a great majority of them. And therefore, things like marriage, boyfriends, um, you know, this kind of uh, situation came up over and over again. And so we talked about, you know, of course, women, the ideal mate, yeah, and uh, who, and, and all. And there was a lot of romance in the camp because they were all of that age group. And the teenagers were doing pretty well also. And <laughs> in fact, we have, uh, I have one of my friends who talked about being at a teenage dance. And for last dance, they took the lights off and they were having such a great time dancing without the lights. And one of the old Issei men came in, 
put up the lights and say, oh no, oh no, not interested, you know, at all, and yelled at them. And uh, they were so embarrassed because the next morning when they went to eat breakfast, the whole camp was talking about those terrible Nisei kids <laughs> who were dancing in the dark and with, with the lights on, there were lipstick marks on some of the boys. <laughs> Question back there. I was just curious how the uh, American camps compared to the Canadian camps. Do you have any information on that? The American camps as compared to? Canadian camps. No. I did go to Canada and we did know that there were camps. I think that American camps were a little bit more open than the Canadian camps, which were much more uh, supervised and uh, Organized. I think people in Canada had uh, a different experience depending on where they went for the camp. And some of the camps were uh, in regular cities. Parts of it were in part of a city. Other places were very uh, hidden away in coal mining districts and things like that. So Canada had a very different experience from the Americans. I think the American experience was a little bit more, uh, less difficult, I think, in many ways. The Canadians never gave the land back. They kept it all. Uh-huh. Well, so. yeah. The, I think they, they took the Canadian, uh, I think they took the Canadian uh, people's uh, houses and things of that kind, and many times took it over, mm -hmm. you know, took it over right. and used that money to pay for the camps in Canada. So some of them were complaining about that fact. So he said, well, you know, we are in the United States. And it was yeah, different in Canadian. many ways. Yeah. So uh, I have a question for Mr. Tokiwa. So I'll read it first. Uh, did you or do you know T. Frank Sugihara, he was in the 442nd, later a Pinole resident, a government scientist, and co-discoverer of San Francisco sourdough French bread. And I think he deserves a medal for giving him sourdough. <laughs> so uh, here's a general question. How are, uh, and this is for all of you, how were you treated by the soldiers in the internment camps? We hardly had any kind of contact with them. There weren't that many, there were, so, were 10,000 of us, maybe 100, 200 soldiers, so they didn't have time to just, just to um, guard over us. We had plenty of time. We had no contact with any soldiers at all. On the other hand, remember there's a, uh, story about the dance band playing uh, a tune. One of them was called uh, Jersey Bounce, a little native uh, bounce, Dirbuck tune. And one of the guards was from New Jersey. He was asking those members of the band to play that several times, but I don't think the message got through, but that was something that was kind of different, the Jersey Bounce. <laughs> well, we were told there was flirting because the uh, Watchtowers were way up high, and they could look down, and they could see the girls over in, in the camp. They, again, you're thinking of young American soldiers who are 18, 19, 20, and of that age, and they see these young Japanese American girls who are in there, and a lot of flirting went on between them. And so in one camp, the old people got ups upset, the Issei got upset that our Japanese American girls were flirting with soldiers who were sentries in the camp. And so they began to uh, put flowers, and bed flowers, so they can't get too near the fence, so that they would have to flirt from far away, <laughs> right by. And so we said, you know, these Japanese Issei, the old people, they really knew how to do things. <laughs> I think, uh, the Young ladies were told not to associate with soldiers yeah. when it came out. You know, the the ladders, papers, yeah, stay away. Yeah. The, 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 uh, the higher ups were probably fearful about the uh, soldiers being seduced by cute Japanese chicks. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question from one of uh, person in the audience. Did you ever hear that some of the architects of the executive order were more interested in obtaining tracts of farmland? and other property 
than they were than they were in preventing supposed sabotage. Mm. I would like to say that there was a very strong economic interest in the properties of the Japanese who had to leave California or leave Oregon or whatever. That there was uh, at the time that we were leaving, uh, people were selling. A car. You know, some people who thought we may never come back again or whatever I need cash would sell their cars for something like ten dollars, would sell their refrigerators and things of that kind, very, very cheap. So there was, uh, there was a group of uh, people uh, outside who uh, wanted to uh, maybe get things inexpensively and uh, add to their own household. So that happened. But there were also other people who also extended themselves and said, we'll look after your property for you. So you had all kinds of reactions from the people outside. Do you remember any specific outcry uh, among the, the local population? Or, or, no. I don't remember any outcry by people. Uh, even the American, the uh, ACLU. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, you know, you would expect at this point that the ACLU would say something about the civil liberties mm -hmm. of people putting into camp with no charges against us, no opportunity for us to make f defense, no trial. Mm -hmm. We were just put into camp because the, the uh, uh, executive order put, just put us into camp. And so it was a very gross violation of civil rights. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, later on, the ACLU did come out with that uh, statement. But at the time it was happening, nobody, a few churches, a few churches did say, this is wrong. And a few uh, people at UC Berkeley came out and said, this was wrong. But no outcry from the population. In fact, they were happy to see a lot of us go. I grew up in the 1940s in Imperial Valley. Yes. And Imperial Valley was very much a Japanese farming yeah. industrial area. And I can recall that a lot of people could hardly wait to buy up all of that farmland around Calipat, mm -hmm. Nyland, uh, Imperial, uh, and over by Hopeville. And so much truck farming was done down there. Yeah. And I can remember that I was in the second grade, and half of my class were seven-year-olds. had to be taken away. And there was a lot of people in Brawley who were very much, you know, involved with the, the Japanese farmers. But they're heartbroken. Yeah. And I can remember that like, in 1953, one of those classmates showed up at the hospital in Mercy Hospital in San Diego. And I was so glad to see her because I was having to take care of her in an iron lung. She had gotten polio. And it was uh, traumatic for me. But I was so glad to see Emma that to know that she survived because I was worried that she'd gone yeah. somewhere in Timbuk yeah. too. But I can remember people buying up that property like crazy. And it was sad because these people worked hard for that That's land. Right. That's Just right. tragic. Yeah. Many of them never came back, so that was even more tragic. Well, what happened with many farmers is should they, when there was all this dissension about what's going to happen to us, because there was a period of time when there was, uh, when, they, when they announced that we would be put away, but at the same time there was a period. And so people thought, well, what, what would happen? Should I um, put seeds in the ground? Should I uh, make sure that uh, I would have a crop? even though I'm not here, or what happens when I'm not here. And they were told by their governmental advisors that if you didn't start your crops at that time, uh, then uh, you would be considered sabotaging. In other words, you had to do it. And so a lot of people did do it, do that. So it just, so many individual different stories that you get about how people reacted to our the other thing I do want to point out is it is a gross violation of civil liberties. There were no trials, no charges, no opportunity for defense at all. And we said, you know, but we were just put in. Yeah. Um, were, did you have your own teachers or were teachers brought the, in? <coughs> I, I do have a comment. You know, an executive, to, to respond to the pers person who wrote this, Executive order is the <laughs> instrument of the President of the United States. He signs the order. And what that executive order did, did was authorize the military to designate 
any area they felt was of military importance that they could exclude anyone from those areas. It didn't matter who. The military could say, this whole area here is of military importance, and therefore no one is allowed here except who we allow in. The only difference was that only the Japanese were excluded from any in that area. And it didn't matter whether you were a citizen <coughs> or an alien, you were excluded. No Italians were, no Germans who were the enemy were excluded. I understood that there was a proposal by the military to include Italians until someone pointed out to him that you cannot exclude Joan DiMaggio's father. Oh, I was just curious about the teachers. Did you have your own teachers, or they brought teachers in, American teachers in, or how, how, did, how did you manage the schooling? How's the schooling managed? Many of the uh, school teachers were, uh, were gotten from local natives or, or school districts. Or I think there must have been a lot of uh, information being sent out to the general public in terms of uh, the needs of these communities. So if, if there's some, a need for school teachers here, uh, they may have come from a close by city or people from hundreds of miles away interested in these kinds of situations. On the other hand, the first part, early parts of the, um, the camping scene, not the camp scene, but the scene itself, <laughs> and put into camps, there are many, many uh, of the older Nisei, my generation, were graduates of college or in college at the same time. Remember, one of my friends was teaching Latin in, uh, in one of the schools at Early L because they had this experience. So there were teachers from the outside and also within the community itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So glad that you guys got through this with such dignity. And I'm so happy that you have attained the level that you have, where you're ever consumed with bitterness. So uh, the question was, were you ever consumed with bitterness? I was. There are, there are 120,000 stories. 120,000. Each person has a story in himself. It depends on the circumstances, how you got in the camps, and what happened to the, the camps itself, or in the camps itself. I, I was 20 years old, playing the dance band camp, working in the hospital. <laughs> but I was in camp for one year. Yeah. One year. And times were hard, yes. And on the other hand, I was apolitical at that time, yeah. and didn't think about civil rights or anything like that. As a matter of fact, Many racial groups did not feel at that time um, a great need to change the system itself. But I achieved my American dream, I think. Something that many people did not because we got through the experience and the, uh, for the, from, the, from our parents, they said, well, this is something that happened. Let's do the best we can. Yeah, That's, that was the fo focus. Instead of saying, oh, damn it, oh, it's terrible, down with America kind of thing, and sitting there, sucking your thumbs, and to, to fall into, uh, what's the word, uh, victimization. I guess that's what it is. It's easy to get into something like that. Or victims, it's terrible, the hell with America. You couldn't have said that. But we said, let's do the best we can. Yeah. Went to okay. camp, I got outside, and I was in the Army. I was um, drafted in the Army. Fortunately, I came back alive. Didn't have to go into warfare, but the point is, I got received the GI Bill of Rights. Yeah. Went to school, got a job. It took a little bit harder than someone else, but got to school. I have a family. I bought a Ford car. <laughs> <laughs> and in those days, post-war years for the my generation, property was relatively cheap after the war, during and during and after the Depression time. So the houses could be bought for. $20,000. So that's when we were able to do it by house. Now we're millionaires. <laughs> but the point is this. Despite the discrimination and putting down of us as a group, I think did, we did well in terms of our 
mm -hmm. uh, the fact that yeah, let's live it, live it, not live it up, but to live, do the best we can, work hard, and uh, I think that's what helped us to to live through it, and reach our my in my case the American dream. Mm -hmm. so we thank the United States yeah, <laughs> for all that. Yeah. I think there was a very big stress on our part, my parents' part, to make sure that we got educated, so that even though we were very poor. We were very poor growing up during the Depression and everything else. But they kept <coughs> pushing, pushing for us to go on to college. UC Berkeley, I hate to tell you, was $26 a semester. <laughs> <laughs> so that we were able to, to get enough money to go to, to go to the university. So that many of the people uh, went on to school. And I think you'll find, uh, in terms of percentage of people, went to college is very high in terms of Japanese Americans. A lot because our parents pushed it, pushed it very strongly. Yeah. The question here is, were you ever consumed with bitterness? Where do we have what? Oh, were you ever, were you ever bitter? Yeah. Were you ever bitter? I don't think I was ever bitter as far as yeah. uh, being in you mean being in camp? Because we were fa actually we were fairly comfortable in the camp, even though it was uncomfortable. It was comfortable in terms of uh, it could have been worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had food, lousy food, but it was food, and we had uh, shelter, and we had friends. And, and families, and that made a big uh, difference. Your family was there, all your friends were there, yeah. uh, you made new ones. <laughs> well, the other thing is, <laughs> we on young. the farm, we used to get up at sunrise, and everybody worked, yeah. even the women. My mother used to have to cook breakfast in the dark, because by the time it became light, we had to go out into the fields to start our work. And then she would come out after she fed the younger kids. And then she would work there until it was about 4, 4.30. Then she'd go walk home, start breakfast, uh, dinner. On Sundays, she came out to the field about 10.30 because she did the washing in the morning. And in those days, I think one, well, three days off during school vacation, the rest of the time we were working, we'd have three vacation days. Fourth of July, for instance, Parent, we would go someplace to the beach. So once we got into camp, they had an eight to five job. <laughs> Not only that, they got rest breaks. Of course, they weren't paid much. The wages were fourteen dollars, sixteen, and twenty-one a month. A month. <laughs> for uh, 40, 45, 44 hours a week. And, but this is the first time like my father had a time to indulge in hobbies. And so he carved, went out into the wood, into the desert, they dug up petrified wood and they would carve things out of it. Uh, he had time to learn how to play the Japanese game of Go, mm -hmm. uh, which he never had time before. And so, for many of the older the older people, they could relax more. They didn't have to worry about where their next meal was coming from. They didn't have to worry about paying for bills. They didn't get paid much. On the other hand, they didn't have to. Uh, much, they didn't have much.
to worry about. But it was a hard life. Living in the desert, you know, we came from San Francisco, then to live in the <coughs> desert with the extremes of temperature, not enough clothing, so that we were really, especially, we did, girls didn't wear trousers in those days. We all wore uh, skirts, and so we all had skirts, and we all had those white shoes with the, you know, saddle shoes, and yeah. we all wore uh, our skirts fairly high, so that it was really cold in, um, uh, and all. We finally did, what happened is that we got so cold, we asked the administration if there was some clothing that they could give us, and all, and clothing, so they gave us a, what is it, five dollars or four dollars a month clothing al allowance, and we all got those uh, Montgomery Ward and Sears Roman, we all wore the same thing, let me add. <laughs> and every time you went to a party, three other people had the same dresses and two. <laughs> but it was, um, what they did was issue these pea coats, and I have a story I wrote about them. But they issued these pea coats. The pea coats were all size 42. And so these Japanese, like my mother, was like four feet ten or eight. And so she wears one, and it's down to her ankle. And there were many Japanese uh, Issei who looked like her, who would put on their size 42 pea coat, and they looked like bears going <laughs> around all over because of the... Uh, but there was an attempt, uh, there was an attempt on the part of administration to listen to what we had to say at all. Sometimes made uh, some helpful things, other times totally disregarded the comfort of the people in the camp. It was not a pleasant experience, even though nowadays we make fun. We look and see what was so, so what was fun, and we dwell on the fun part, but not on the fact that you went to the toilet, toilets are right next to each other like this. We were in, um, uh, I guess we were in Greece, and we were in one of the islands of Greece, and we saw the people way back in uh, what the second century with toilets that look yeah. just like the ones we had. <laughs> we said, wow, that's just like the camp toilet, <laughs> all next to one another. But it was, it was difficult, especially for people who had any kind of illness. If you had asthma, forget it. The desert was not a good place. Uh, but if you had uh, any problem, if you were like my age, you had to go with a cane, uh, it was very difficult, very difficult, because you had to go to the bathroom, which was pretty far away, and I don't know how, how they did it. These old people having to go in the middle of the night, two or three times a night, mm -hmm. when it's dark, they have to take their flashlight and have to go all the way over there to the bathroom and all. Uh, one shower and uh, one uh, a, uh, into the block. You had to wait forever to take a shower, forever to take a bath, if you were in the bath, you didn't want to come out because it felt so comfortable. But there were alive people waiting to get into the bath, too. So it was, there were a lot of difficult things in the camp in terms of comfort. But I think more than anything else, it was being behind barbed wire. There was barbed wire fence all around. And if you got too close to them, and in fact, in our camp, one man got very close because his dog was going towards the fence. So he went after the fence and he was shot because he went too close to the fence. So you had to be very careful how you, where you walked and how you walked. Nobody escaped from our camp. There was no way of escaping in Utah. All they had was desert and you'll die for <laughs> just being in the desert for days to be able to get out. So there was no escape as far as I know from the camp while I was there. Nobody tried because it was too <coughs> difficult. Life was difficult, even though we could kind of like make fun of it at this point uh, to look back on it. But while you were there, it was very difficult at all. But most of all, I think, I never knew this because I was so naive, but when I got out of camp and I began to read about the uh, civil liberties and about the fact that the ACLU and, and all, then I began to realize what a terrible uh, situation it was where we were put away just like that with none of our liberties, none of the civil liberties that we find in the Constitution. 
None of them applied to us. And I think this is the thing that we wanted to share with everybody is make sure that these things don't happen to any group and any body and all to make sure that the civil liberties of every person in our country should be uh, kept, you know, kept and that they should uh, fight against anything where you deprive people of their rights. And I think this is something we learned and this is probably why we give a lot of talks. In the back. I, I think you probably answered it just now, but I remember the hysteria and the fear my parents had of the Japanese during the war. I was very small, but I, I remember that. And on a national level, you had national hysteria and national fear. Do you think it could happen again? Do you think that's a possibility? Because then it wasn't a possibility, but then circumstances yeah. of war came. Yeah. And it, it certainly could. It certainly could. If there was, for example, an attack by uh, a terrorist attack or something of that kind, there would be a big uh, a call in the United States, I think, of how do you deal with it. And there will be people who take very extreme positions. And I think that uh, it's possible, but we hope not that it won't happen. And we think that there are enough civil libertarians in, the, in our country, ordinary people who know what's, what, uh, how people should be treated as a group. We think there's enough people in our population so that it won't be repeated. I hope. So, here, more a response. All my Korean friends during the Korean War were deathly afraid that exactly the same thing yeah. would happen to them. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. In fact, during World War II, there were some Chinese people who yeah. put, I'm Chinese, yes, so yes, that course. they wouldn't be mistaken for <laughs> us. <laughs> so, 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 can I follow yeah. up on a yeah. little bit on that? So when you were in camp and you were in school, you were studying, studying history, yeah. how did you feel when you were giving the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? With liberty and justice for all. I mean, yeah. I'm sorry. Did the, my sister was talking about the fact that she saw these group of teenage kids, teenage Japanese American boys and girls, and they were talking, and they were, somebody said, hey, they're doing the Pledge of Allegiance, you should be doing it. And they said, what in the hell should I do that? We're stuck in camp like this, that ain't no America. And so it was really something, we all gasped because we were, quote, so patriotic and all. Some of us, you know, uh, growing up with the school system and everything else, we didn't quite see how terrible it was and injustice in terms of civil liberties until I got out and studied what the whole thing was about. And I really did a lot of research to see what this really meant. It meant something that all Americans should know about. Don't let the 